Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. We're once again recording at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. And this is... Let let me see if I'll fuck up the title. (laughs) Gilbert and Frank's Amazing Colossal Obsession. You are a pro's pro. That's what you are. And And, who do we have here today, Mr. Gottfried? Today with us we have... Patty Farmer, whose new book is Playboy Laughs. That's it. The comedy, comedians, and cartoons of Playboy. Colossal obsessions. Patty, welcome. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Of course. Now, we were talking. (laughs) By the way, (laughs) off the record. Patty, and it's on the mic. Patty said uh, that uh, she worked with the singer Julie Budd. Oh, She yes. interviewed Julie Budd for the book, and Julie Budd worked with a million comics. And what did Julie Budd say about comedians? Julie Budd said, you're all very peculiar. <laughs> she- <laughs> How do you respond, Gilbert? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm I'm totally normal. <laughs> How can you respond? <laughs> she, she's that's exactly, and she made that face. You know, they're all very peculiar. <laughs> she says they're not a laugh a minute off stage. Oh, that's so untrue in his case. <laughs> Peculiar. And what were some of the things she was saying like? Like, well, number one, the insecurity. Exactly. Uh, She talked about Charlie Callis and uh, opening for him and then looking at him over breakfast. And, uh, you know, he was like, well, is this funny? You know, the way I eat my cereal, is that funny? Could I do something with this? And she's like, I'm 13 years old. You know, leave me alone. I (laughs) I had an experience on a plane where I was sitting toward the back of the plane and in uh the the stewardess, like an Asian stewardess, came up to me and she goes, Oh, you know, she recognized me and she goes, Oh, you're Gilbert Caffrey. She goes, A Chari Karis is on the plane. <laughs> Char- go go oh up God. and say hello to Chari Karis. And I said, well, I've, I've never met him before. I don't want to. And she walks away and comes back and says, oh, Jerry can say, tell Godfrey get fucking ass up here. <laughs> <laughs> and I witnessed this. It was a, a great. And I mean, the flight was terrific. Because he was joking. You and, rode on a plane with Charlie yeah, Cal. You flew on a plane with Charlie It Cal. was like, and it was like L.A. to New York, which is like six hours. And he's joking and doing voices wow. and the sound effects. It's like the greatest flight ever. And then he's, we're talking. We're, we're carrying our luggage. And he goes, hey, where are you from? And I go, Brooklyn. And he goes, yeah, me too. Uh, typical childhood playing stickball, stickball in the street and uh, making the kids laugh and then them telling me I should be in show business and the uh, first time you're on stage is the greatest feeling in the world. And then there's a pause and Callis looks at me and he goes, and then you wake up one day and you go, I'm not funny. Wow. Out and, of the blue. Yeah. Yeah. So after an hour, it's five hours of entertaining you, the insecurity comes yes. to the surface. Yes. It's fascinating. Yeah. So we, Julie was right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> they were all case studies. So Patty, how did you become a showbiz historian? Kind of like us. I, well, I've, I've always loved it. And uh-huh. my background's business. But uh, about 10 years ago, there was no business all of a sudden. You know, the, the big uh, recession or uh, as... My people, the Irish say, you know, the trouble years, uh, we hit the recession and I didn't have anything to do. So I was able to uh, feed this obsession of mine. Um, And I realized I was living over at the plaza Uh and there used to be a nightclub there, the Persian room. And I was curious, you know, I loved history, went to the management, wanted to look through their archives and they said they had no archives. And... Now, the plaza turns 110 this year, 
and they don't have any archives. And they told me that was because, you know, Conrad Hilton and Zsa Zsa Gabor owned it at one time, and President Trump and uh, Ivanka owned it at one time. And when each owner left, they took whatever they wanted with them. You know, the Marilyn Monroe uh, photographs, the Beatles memorabilia, wow. you know, all this history. So uh, having nothing to do, I just put it back together and started calling people. Diane Carroll, Leslie Gore, Patty Page. You just picked up the phone and started calling people and you put this history together. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. and you were living in the plaza like that girl in the children's book. Eloise. Eloise. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So if this was a, you are a real life Eloise. Well, I don't know about that, but talking to Diane Carroll, she claims her daughter was the black Eloise. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> and this was your first book. Right. And, and I was really surprised how many people agreed to talk to me and it wasn't you know has been so it was not that anybody's a has been but you know it's Jack Jones and Diane Carroll and and Polly Bergen and Celeste Holmes all these people sat down and uh, you know spent the afternoon a lot of them became friends and told me stories that's cool yeah yeah well we're we're always surprised when people agree to do our show We, we're similar. You could surprised. walk out any time. <laughs> we're used to it. And then you decided to do a book about the history of the Playboy Clubs. I did, only because I was doing all this other history, and people kept telling me stories. You know, when I was at the Playboy Club, uh, you know, I did this and did that. And I had never really thought much of Playboy other than, you know, the first thing that pops into everybody's minds, you know, bunnies and centerfolds. Sure. sure. But uh, once I did some research, what surprised me was that in over 50 years of people writing about Playboy, writing about the bunnies, writing about the centerfolds, writing about Hugh Hefner, the girls next door, everything else, nobody ever wrote about the entertainers, the musicians and singers and comedians that came out of the Playboy TV shows and the clubs. And there's a lot of history there, so it's surprising that nobody... Really ever? Gil, did you ever play any of the Playboy clubs? Uh, no. In your travels? No, never. Interesting. Did a Playboy club, and and you said that there was like basically a law at the Playboy clubs that the comics couldn't date any of the bunnies. Absolutely, Hands that off the was the, the big uh, the big rule. Uh, but you know, put put comics and bunnies together, and what do you think's going to happen? You know, you right, have of course. Lou Alexander getting a. A trophy at the Chicago Club for dating the most bunnies and Rich Little telling stories. He told a story in the book about yeah. yep. uh, dating the bunnies. So. Tom Dreesen, too. Exactly. Yeah, there's a couple exactly. of different <laughs> stories in the book of comics breaking the rules. It, if if I worked at the Playboy Club, I'd be uh, back in my hotel whacking off. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have pursued any of the bunnies? Yeah. You wouldn't have had the... No, I failed miserably. <laughs> So this is interesting, too, that the, the first club opened in Chicago in 1960, and it was based on another club in Chicago, on the Gaslight Club. Right. That was the, the genesis of it. That was. Uh, Playboy magazine wrote an article about the Gaslight Clubs, and Hef's uh, second in charge went to him and uh, told him, we have all these letters, you know, which we're talking 1958, 59, yeah. and the letters you guys, you know, would actually write letters pre-internet. You'd write them out, address an envelope, put a stamp on them, and send them in. And it was Playboy's custom. They would answer every one. But Victor said to Hef, he said, you know, I'm going to have to hire more girls to answer all these letters because they had gotten over 3,000 letters about this Gaslight Club. So um, Hef and Victor were just kicking back and uh, they kind of looked at each other at the same time and said, you know, why the hell are we promoting another guy's club? You know, I wish we had our own club. And it was really as simple as that. You know, they kind of said, well, yeah, we know about entertainment and we know about uh, waitresses, but we don't know bumpkiss about the restaurant business. Right. And Victor said, I know a buddy down the street who does. And so they went down to Arnie Morton's place and... You know, all young guys in their 20s at this time. Of the Morton Steakhouse uh, fame. Right. Right. You know, later on, he opened the the steakhouse chain. But at that time, they're in their 20s, sitting around, said, let's do it. They each threw in $10,000. 
and they stirred the Playboy Club. Imagine that, Gil. And, 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 and have you ever posed for Playboy? <laughs> and why would you ask that? <laughs> Because I want to see how familiar I am with you indirectly. Oh, oh but Just did because you, you saw the... the previous guest naked, <laughs> yes. Bill Macy, doesn't mean you... <laughs> but I thought you read it for the articles. Yes, he yes. does. <laughs> he does. And there was the rabbit-headed, the, 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 the metal key became a, it right. became a status symbol. It really did. Yeah. And uh, uh, Dick Gregory, you know, one of the early comedians that... lost him. That performed there, unfortunately, yeah. We're losing a lot, you know. Uh, Irwin Corey, too. Irwin Corey was the first comic to play the Playboy Clubs? Yeah. 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 I I met um, Dick Gregory at the You Have No Roast. I bet that was fabulous. Were you there in person? Yeah, I I was there. I was sitting with him, and and I did the uh, Aristocrats there. And afterwards, Dick Gregory came over to me and complimented me, and and he shakes my hand tightly, and he goes, and I want to thank you for your beautiful mind. Isn't that wow. nice? Yeah. What and a we, nice compliment. And we never got Dick Gregory on this show. No. I well, kick, I didn't want to rush it. <laughs> which I could kick myself for. <laughs> it's interesting, too, uh, the, the stuff about in the book about uh, Hefner being so progressive. When it comes to somebody like Dick Gregory. Definitely. Well, that was really uh, Hef for, he was all about civil rights, you know, First Amendment rights, even women's rights, which, you know, he gets a bad rep there. But uh, he was all about freedom to do whatever you wanted, gay rights, whatever. Right. But concerning Dick Gregory, uh, we were operating in segregated America in 1960, uh, pre Civil Rights Act of 64, and uh, he put Dick Gregory in front of an all-white audience. And not only that, it was Meat Packers from Alabama. Yeah, it's one of the book's best stories. And uh, I don't want to ruin the story, but uh, a 40-minute act turned into uh, three hours. Yeah, it's a great story. I remember at the roast, every other comic's roasting him and tearing him apart, Dick um, Hugh Hefner. And when Dick Gregory got up, he didn't have anything bad, even jokingly, to say about you, Hefner. He was just honoring him. Yeah. He He looked out for him. He publicly credits him with helping to break the color barrier. Uh, But that was Hefner. He did that even before the clubs on his TV show. He put Nat King Cole on the TV show and had a lot of blowback, you know, 1959 to have... A uh, black man, even at the height of his popularity, sit down, which he did uh, on the TV show. On Playboy's Penthouse? Yeah. yeah with, the first uh, show. Before Playboy, after Dark. You, right, right. With uh, He sat down with Rona Jaffe, mm-hmm. who was a white woman, and they talked literature. And the next day at Playboy, the networks and the sponsors sure. threatened to pull the show, pull advertising, and uh, Hefner didn't back down. Well, these are the days when, when people went insane because Harry Belafonte touched Petula Clark oh, yes. right. on, on primetime television. And and uh, I remember it's like back then, like the late 60s, and the feminist movement was at its peak. And and they all, I mean, the one person they all hated, of course, was you Hefner. That's right. But, you know, Hef in the early 60s in the magazine was the first one to champion women's rights, to champion pro-choice. He wrote about pro-choice. He wrote about uh, making the pill available, probably had some nefarious mm-hmm. thoughts there. Uh, but, you know, he really was for for freedom of choice, women's rights. And uh, he gets a bad rep for that. That's interesting. And also, as far as the the, uh, the the civil rights and him being active, he bought two of his clubs back. Exactly. At a huge uh, loss to Playboy. Right. And just to explain to our listeners, because the clubs were run by the franchise, the people who uh, manage them. Right, right. Or, that, or owned them, I guess. It, it, was, it was a franchisee right. arrangement, That's which was a, a brilliant idea of Hef's. You know, that was not something that was common in uh, 1960. That was brand new concept. And he wanted to expand the clubs rapidly, the circuit of clubs. So he opened uh, Miami and New Orleans with partners, with franchise partners, uh, not even thinking they would 
enforce the segregation laws, but they did. And Hefner was, you know, shocked and uh, dismayed and bought them back within months of them opening for uh, triple what they had purchased the rights for. Yeah, it's that's fascinating. It's one of the yeah. fascinating things in the book. And Dick Gregory never forgot him for it, for, for helping him. And, and, and another guy he championed was Lenny Bruce. Definitely. Uh, the first comic on his TV show. Uh, Lenny was hysterical. I'm sure you, you saw that bit, you know, about the tattoo mm-hmm. and his aunt. But, um, you know, he tried to help him. You know, I don't think anybody could uh, save Lenny from himself. But nevertheless, he uh, sent his Playboy lawyers around the country defending his uh, First Amendment rights. And Now, I, I just kind of flashback of, uh, and I don't remember anything of it, of course, uh, where when they were cracking down on you, Hefner, I guess the government or whatever, and there was a young woman who was who worked for Hefner, whose life was destroyed. Right, right. And I'm going to get her name totally mixed up. Uh, but it was his personal assistant. And uh, they came after her on drug charges and wanted to uh, flip her into uh, ratting on Hefner, which she didn't. Interesting. Uh, which she claimed until she committed suicide. He had no involvement with drugs. But... That really destroyed Hef and uh, some credit it with uh, bringing on his first heart attack. So so they basically drove her to suicide. Definitely. What about the mob? He had to sit down with the mob, too, early on in the game because the mobs were so entangled and involved with, with nightclubs. Definitely. And how did he handle that? Nobody, nobody really believes that Playboy could stay out of the the mob world. You know, the mob, 1960s, Chicago, New York, Miami. Of course, you're in bed with the mob. But um, the way Hef and Victor Lowndes tell it was that early on, when they started expanding, Hef did have a visit from certain family members, Mm -hmm. and they sat down and put forth the idea that Hef should be partners with them. And Hef, uh, in that calm way, you know, if you've ever spoken to him, he's just very, uh, reduces everything just down to the simple. And he looked at them and he said, I have the eyes of the federal government, all local government, and the Catholic Church on me constantly trying to close me down. Do you really think I'm the best partner to be involved with. And uh, that was something they understood. And they, they said, you're totally right. And they left. And How about they, that, Gil? Yeah. <laughs> he managed to keep them, yes. out of the, <laughs> keep them out of the equation. How many clubs in the heyday? There was Miami, New Orleans, New York. How many more? Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> there's a prize. There's a prize uh, for naming them all. No, there was 42, 42. worldwide. Worldwide, which was a great circuit. The comedians right, loved it. Uh, Jerry Van Dyke told me he worked for years just doing the circuit, 40 weeks a year, until he was good enough to move up to the next level. And, you know, he got discovered at a Playboy Club, at the Miami Playboy Club. Earl Wilson came in, saw him, write a col- wrote a column. Earl's Pearls. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The, the list of comics that, that, that did the clubs is just, you, you know, and I was saying some of the people we've had on this show, Shecky, Rich Little, Larry Storch, but also you'll love these names, Gil, uh, Jackie Vernon, Jackie Gale, Shelley Berman, uh, John Biner, who we had here, Howard Storm. And, and they loved the, the clubs. They loved performing for working for Hefner. Definitely. There were, there were different groups. You know, you had uh, the up-and-comers, you know, and even Joan Rivers starting out, uh, she told me, Uh, She said, you know, I wasn't hatched out of an egg as a headliner. She said I started at the Playboy Club as part of a trio. Did you know that she was part of a trio, Joan Rivers? I I mean, I had just read that recently. Isn't that interesting? I didn't know. In my book, right? (laughs) Yes. That actually is the case. And and the book, again— is Playboy Laughs. What was the name of the tr- the trio that she was uh, in? Jim, Jake, and Joan. And what happened to Jim and Jake? And they got kicked to the curb. Okay. They got kicked <laughs> to the curb. Jim, Jake, uh, and Joan. I <laughs> can't believe I didn't know this. Joan told me she was the glue that held them all together. And finally, 
the infighting. She said she didn't need it. And she moved up to uh, stand up and then she moved up to headliner all the while uh, staying with Playboy. She came back at uh, all different stages. She loved Playboy. Now, I, I've only been in my career to one Playboy party. And uh, that about as far as I can explain uh, the party, the, about the most uh, wild thing was girls in body paint. And you Were know, you at the mansion? Of, yeah. Okay. You didn't see them swimming naked. You didn't go to the in grotto. The bar well, and- uh, no, nothing. I mean, I don't remember much going on. Was James the, Conn wait there? Wait a minute. Wait uh, a minute. No, James <laughs> Conn wasn't there. Peter really? Sellers wasn't <laughs> there. Tony Curtis, Robert Culp <laughs> wasn't on, there. You went on an Bill off day. Cosby. Bill, Bill Cosby. Cosby. <laughs> uh, that. That that makes a whole other. <laughs> That's a different kind of party. <laughs> now, I heard at one time, like the the year I went and those years around it, it stuff had quieted down at the Playboy party. Was that during the years that Hef got married? Uh, maybe might have been. Yeah. You know, because he got married to Kimberly Conrad, right? And uh, those kids are actually running Playboy now. They're all grown up. But during those years, uh, the bunny crossing was changed to, you know, kids at play. I remember and, reading that, that yeah. people would go to the match and they'd be disappointed to see a stroller in the corner yes. or a big wheel. Now, but Timing. It's yeah. bad timing. At one time, <laughs> it timing. really was wild. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Like, what was going on at the Playboy party? What parties? wasn't going on? Yeah, from uh, what everybody tells me, it was... Um, it was the swinging 60s, you know, and everything you thought that would be, you know, naked girls, uh, later on, girls on roller skates. Are we talking about the mansion now or the, some of the clubs? The mansion. Okay, the mansion. because there's... there's that yeah. what you were asking? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. mansion. Mansion. And conversely, Hef kept the clubs very clean. Because you, know? you, you allude to that in the book. Was there, right. another, was there a second floor no, in the clubs? No, definitely not. You right. know, he and, kept them clean even like george carlin was there uh and a good friend of hef's until he got to the seven words you couldn't say oh, yeah, on that's TV. one of the interesting things in the book and, gil they were encouraged but, to work clean yes and then yes. carlin and richard pryor and people like that were coloring outside the lines and they had to go and right. and and hefner said to carlin uh you know you you're my best friend i love you but you you can't work in my clubs anymore. Exactly. He said, I'll come and see you somewhere else. But, you know, he wanted to keep the clubs clean. Right. He wanted the three martini lunch generation to be able to come and do their business deals and then bring their girlfriends back on Friday night, maybe their wife on Saturday night. But, um, you know, have it a, a clean, clean place where people just came and had fun, looked at the bunnies. They were a novelty but um, right, Disneyland for adults. Drink. Exactly, they right. had to get dressed up. It was. I mean, it's already pretty common knowledge now. But um, Gloria Steinem became a Playboy bunny for a while. Yeah, she wrote an article about it. Yeah, she went undercover to expose uh, the terrible conditions the bunnies lived under. But I have to tell you, I interviewed scores of bunnies and. Nobody complained about it. They loved working it. They loved the money. It's interesting. Uh, it was a lot of uh, college girls, a lot of young mothers. Uh, uh, oh, God, what's her name? Uh, I forget her first name, Bon Jovi. I uh, used to bring her little son to work with her. She was a young mother, and when okay. her babysitter flaked on her, she would bring her, her child to work, and he'd sit in the kitchen and grew up to be uh, John Bon Jovi. You know, that's... Oh, uh, interesting. I uh, didn't his know His mom that. was... Oh, I, I know the one you're talking about, and I forget her name, too. Yeah, her first name... John Bon Jovi's me. mom was a Playboy yeah, bunny. in New York. Yeah, at the, at no, the, I, a waitress. I, I picture her yeah. in my head, of interesting. course. And a former Marine. So, uh, you know, a former Marine, young mother. And explain what a bunny mother was, too. A bunny mother was, uh, you have to realize, we're back in the day right. when you could tell girls they uh, were too old and too fat and, you know, all the other things. So once you had a few years on you uh, and it was deemed that you could not be a bunny anymore, 
and you were well thought of by the management and the girls. You moved up to be the bunny mother, and more or less she enforced the rules, made sure your stocking seams were straight and your uniform was clean, and uh, monitored the bunnies. And Victor Lowne's girlfriend was the one that came up with the idea of the bunnies in the first place? Uh, One of his girlfriends, yes, yes. And, uh, well, she came up with the outfit. Victor Lowne's, who, as you said, was Hefner's second in command. Right. Now, I heard James Caan, when he got a divorce, got over his heartbreak. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. We can all sympathize with him. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, The only way he could deal with his heartbreak (laughs) by living at At the the Playboy Mansion. Mansion. Yes. And to top things off, he had his little boy with him. And I heard he would say to his little boy, you know, he'd look out the window and say, "Uh, you know, get me that that redhead by the pool. Really? Say I want to talk to her. <laughs> Is that the uh, guy that's on Hawaii Five O now? I think so. Scott wow. Scott, yeah. We need to talk yeah. to him. We got to interview him. We yeah. need to talk to him. And I heard he used to have uh, his boy as a messenger, and the bunnies would say, "Oh, that's so cute." And then, of course, he was Sonny Corleone. I mean, my God. Yeah. <laughs> There's also some great stories. Uh, one of the, what I gravitated to in the book was the, the stories about the comics and the heckling. And the and the, the great heckling stories. I mean, and Dick Gregory was abused to the point where how did he, how did he practice before he well, went to the well, club? Well, every every night before he went uh, to the Playboy Club or any other club, while his wife was uh, you know ironing his shirt, she would heckle him, but heckle him with the most vile racial slurs you could imagine. Can you imagine that, Gil? Uh, wow. Just so that he was warmed to up to prep him. To wow. scream racial slurs and, and indignities and things at him yeah. while he was oh prepping at home yeah. to go to the... You and Dara should try that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 She, Dick Dara, told me, Dara does scream anti-black <laughs> remarks to me. No, she so just says I'm you're... Ready it's so to odd that she would do that. <laughs> she just says you're peculiar. <laughs> she yells racist things at me. So eventually, the you know the heyday starts to to come to an end, and the and the end is near, and the last club winds up closing in what 1988, right? Last, right, the last and American I, club, U.S. Per, club. Personally, I think they went longer than they really should have. Right, uh, they were really great to be that bridge from the nightclubs of the 50s that were waning to the comedy clubs of the 70s, you know, that were coming up, the improv and sure. comedy club. But they went a little bit longer than that because Playboy had more money than God and they could could keep them going for as long as yeah, they Yeah, they wanted. really didn't want to give it up, to give up the ghost. I mean, if you, you read the book, they just yeah. keep doubling down, even though the, the, kind of the time is working against them. You know, Playboy and Disco, they they were kind of, uh, they didn't mix. And, and, and would you happen to know the name of the person recently who decided, let's have Playboy without the nudity? Wasn't that crazy? Oh, I think <laughs> it was that. Hefner's son. I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, that was, uh, Cooper brought it back. Oh, Cooper. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, Cooper brought it back uh, just a couple months ago. Right. Yeah. But, well, it was I good mean, for publicity. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I, it it got sounded them into, got them very the much like New Coke. Yeah. <laughs> they changed the recipe, then <laughs> everyone's going, oh my God, we want our classic Coke back. And then when they came back, it was like Jesus returning. It could be, but they were gone for a year. And they also did away with the comics, you know, the cartoons, which was a big part of the magazine. And and also, whose idea was it to put in that old lady cartoon? Oh, oh, that was... The what? It, that grossed that, me out. There was, <laughs> for, for there was a recurring to. court. Annie Fanny, Fanny right? Years. Yeah, Granny yes. Annie Fanny or... Um, oh, well, no, the, no, Granny. Granny, They turned right, Little right. Annie Fanny into no, a no, Granny? No, no, Little, little Annie, Annie Fanny. 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 My mistake. Little Annie right, Fanny right. was one of those yeah, cards. Yeah. great Harvey Kurtzman. I whacked it too. <laughs> now, <laughs> which I think you should Way know. too much information. Yes, but they had the Granny ones. Right. 
with like an old lady with wow. sagging breasts. I don't. Who's and I found it so gross. Wow, shame on me for not knowing that. <laughs> so you but asked- little Annie Fanny, I like <laughs> little Annie Fanny, right? Is iconic. Right, and that was Harvey Kurtzman. He's the great Harvey Kurtzman. Um, but it turned out to be actually like an assembly line. He couldn't get yep, it done. That's right. It was such a, a work of art that he couldn't get it done. And in the book, I tell you know some hysterical. Uh, antics trying to get it done. Hefner brought in Arnie Roth. That's right. And uh, Al Jaffe Both and Davis us. and uh, a bunch of them just get out this cartoon. Well, and Hefner was a, was a, uh, wanted to be a cartoonist himself, so he had a he had a fondness for these people. He did, and for cartooning, and, and that's and, part of your book. I mean, it's not just about it's the it's the history of the clubs, but it's also about it's it's Playboy's really uh, the the history of humor in Playboy. So there's a section of the book where you go into the cartoonists like Roth, like Jaffe, Jack Cole we were talking about before we right. turned the mics on. Antonio Vargas. Antonio you know, Vargas. A lot of them, uh, Wilson. Right. Yeah, Al Jaffe. But, you know, Hefner did want to be a cartoonist, and he was good, but he wasn't good enough. He submitted his work around Chicago, and uh, what a different world it would have been if uh, he had been successful. Absolutely. Strange. Strange turn. So we've been asked this question a million times. I mean, what was the reason, uh, do you think? I mean, maybe there were several. We talked about the end of the Borscht Belt and what the reasons for that were. Remember, Gil? Oh, we had yes. Marissa here. Why did the Playboy Clubs, was it the changing culture? Was it, was it they weren't hip anymore? Um, they were losing money all along. Well, from, uh, I'd say, the mid-'70s to uh, when they finally started closing them all. But the London Club was also a casino, and it was the largest... Uh, revenue-producing casino in the world over any Vegas casino, on, over any uh, Caribbean casino. And that just floated all the other clubs and kept them going. And that shut down. That got shut down by the government. And when, you know, the goose that laid that was it. the golden bucks yeah. got cut off, there was uh, no money coming in. Were they a victim of their own success in a way? They were. Playboy? You, you I mean, hit the, clu- it. the club specifically, not the magazine. I agree with you totally. They started making money. They started making way too much money in the very, very early years that no one paid attention to deadlines. You know, if it cost them, you know, $10,000 more to miss a deadline or $100,000, it didn't matter. Um, you know, Hefner wanted the very best. He paid for it, uh, whether it was, you know, editors or writers or... Uh, singers or comics or buildings. So uh, they were. The answer is yes. I, I, I also remember getting back to uh, Little Annie Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> that you, then Penthouse did oh. Wicked Wanda oh. as a total rip Oh, that's so funny. Of Little Annie Fanny. The things you remember, the, yeah. the two <laughs> that are stored in your brain but never cease to fascinate I'm an me. intellectual. You Penthouse, are. Penthouse came on the, the scene and started the pubic wars. Right, the pubic <laughs> wars. <laughs> that's what we confused with the punic Several wars. Several people were killed in that. <laughs> yes. The pubic wars. I love that. Well, they say that that made Playboy look quaint. It did. Where it was one shocking, right. and now it was cute. I remember the first time I noticed pubic hair in Playboy. Yeah, it and was I a thought, big thing. oh my god. Yeah, it, you know, it was probably Victor Lowndes' wife because she was the first full frontal. A model in response to these wars that were going on. <laughs> Gil- Gilbert's uh, now going to write a book about the pubic wars. Yes. <laughs> Where do I enlist? <laughs> uh, you, also you, talk- you can do the field work, all right. Yes. So, uh, but, I wouldn't uh, mind dying on the battlefield there. <laughs> <laughs> Just your luck, you'd be 4F. Yes. <laughs> And the other thing too that you talk about in the book, and we and you touched on it briefly, is is the television shows, is Playboy's Penthouse, and then Playboy After Dark. And, and wasn't Playboy originally going to be called Penthouse? It was. It was it had a, a couple different names. It was going to be a Stag Party. Oh yeah, Stag Party. And that was right. already copyrighted. Uh, they played around with uh, Penthouse and discarded that and came up with Playboy. 
that, and everybody kind of agreed on you that. You could write a whole book, too, about Trump, about the ma- not not the president, but the magazine. The magazine. Yeah, the that, fa- Playboy's uh, failed attempt at a humor magazine. I love the line, uh, uh, it only went as far as two issues. Right. And uh, Harvey Kurtzman was in charge of it, and he robbed Mad Magazine That's of right. all the great cartoonists. And uh, when asked about the failure of Trump, uh, Hugh Hefner said he gave Harvey an unlimited budget and he surpassed yes, it. Yes, he exceeded it. That's <laughs> one of my favorite lines. So the, the, the book goes into detail about a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff about the TV shows. The TV debut of Burns and Carlin, by the way. Oh, my God. Which you would find interesting. And Moms Mabley singing Abraham, Martin, and John, which also happened on, uh, on that show. Which I, we which we talked about. I'm still looking for a copy of Mons Mabley singing Shamus of the Shoe. Well, I'll, I'll see if Whoopi can hook you up. Yes, yeah, exactly. but there, there's so much in that book, and there's so much good stuff. I didn't know Tim Dreesen and and uh, Tom Dreesen and Tim Reed were a comedy duo. Oh yes, did you know that Tom yes. and Tim? I did know that, and uh, on on his show. Uh, WKRP? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Tom Dreesen did a guest That's, appearance. Oh, how about that? Yeah. I didn't know Joan Rivers was a trio. I didn't know Tom Dreesen was a duo. I didn't know David Brenner was the guy that told Steve Martin to, to cut off his hair and put on a suit. Uh, stick with me. <laughs> stick with me. I'll teach you things you never knew. Cubic wars and everything. There's even Pat McCormick. Oh, of course. In the book. <laughs> so you guys have to get this book. And Gilbert, here's names. Kelly Monteith, Lonnie Shore. You remember these names? Yes. Our friends Steve, Stewie Stone and Dick Capri turn up in the book. Lou Alexander, who we talked about. So it's really a comprehensive history. There's There's so much in there. And then there's the whole section about the cartoonists. Which we didn't and, even really get into in depth. And I heard Shel the, the grotto to this day, they can't kill the germs that have grown <laughs> in that place. <laughs> That's not in the book. <laughs> you should, there's a story in the book about the uh, cartoonists when they went to the mansion to do Little Annie Fanny mm-hmm. and the grotto and how they got it all backwards. They didn't realized beautiful girls were supposed to be swimming in there and they took turns swimming and watched each other. Oh, wow. Well, there's, and the, 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 the second part of the book where you get into the cartoonists, and we talked about Jack Cole, and we didn't talk about Shel Silverstein and all of these other people, but it's really fascinating. It's Thank a you. fascinating history. And you're working on another one? Playboy Thinks, about uh, what you all told your wives and girlfriends and mothers, you know, that you only read it for the articles. Uh, <laughs> we're going to cover the, the writers and the interviews and uh, well, I, editors. I remember The Fly... Uh, came out in Playboy first. The that later became the movie with oh, Vincent really? Price. Really, The Fly was a, a nov- novella or something. Do I have some memory of you appearing in Playboy or doing uh, yeah, a bit or I, an article? I, or I some... wrote a couple of articles for Playboy, and and you could see my pubic hair. Really, in some early <laughs> issues. Yeah, I didn't but know that. that's I thought it was airbrushed <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote a couple of articles, and one, I remember they were going to take pictures of me, and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be my chance to be with like a thousand yeah. playmates. Right? And? But at the last second, they didn't. Oh, yeah. if your parents could see you in Playboy magazine, <laughs> if they could see you now. <laughs> so people can get the book on Amazon, and I assume wherever books. Barnes & Noble, yep. uh any good and bookstore. And Playboy Laughs, The Comedy Comedians and Cartoons of Playboy by Patty Farmer. A fun read. Patty, thanks. Well, I have to Thank find you. naked pictures of John because... <laughs> now, by the way, starting we started the show by you suggesting and putting out there this idea that comics are a little strange and a little bit weird. What's your, what's your verdict now, 35 minutes later? I'm going to go back and talk to Julie and... <laughs> Tell her my stories. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. We Thank appreciate you for inviting it. Inviting me. Bye bye. <laughs>
This has been an Earwolf production. Executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Chris Bannon, and Colin Anderson. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. Earwolf.